You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and welcome, Herds, yep. to the end of India. I can't believe we've reached the end of India. It's I, I can't believe we're never going to see it again. Thousands of years of history down the drain. It's going to disappear in a lightning flash, I assume, and then it'll be gone. <laughs> we are discussing Suchata Massey's The Bombay Prince, chapters 1 to 12, and this will be... The last step in our now long-running Indian tour. Look, we started been great. with Murder in Old Bombay, went through The Dying Day, then The Shadows of Men, then A Dire Isle, and now The Bombay Prince. Thankfully, uh, The Bombay Prince does include a handy summary of the previous novels. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, <laughs> yep. we're not going to be doing spoilers <laughs> here for all of the previous books, but I need to let you know that I chose this mm-hmm. because- Everything that happened in the previous books we've <laughs> covered it. happens in this one. Yep. You have to understand the Bombay Prince is about 10,000 pages long. <laughs> it is an epic tale. No, not really. <laughs> I wish. I would love to read that. My goodness. We've yeah. mentioned Sajada Massey a bit on this show. We spoke about her in short with Ankita Ratho. I brought up the first novel in the series, The Widows of Malabar Hill, or uh, Murder on Malabar Hill, depending on your region, in our discussion of broader Indian fiction. And- I have gone through, while we've been doing this stretch, and read, I want to say, 16 Indian historical fiction novels. Damn, that's a, that's a lot. One might say too many, but apparently- It feels like too many, and I want to get into that. <laughs> Good grief. I want to get into that later on in this segment. Okay. But I chose this novel because in all of the novels that I read, preparing for this this adventure on the show, this was the one that felt like the most resounding gong. Sure. To conclude our journey with. Look, I mean, I'm into it so far. I'm only, you know, I'm the one solving, so I haven't read the whole thing yet, but we're following this like lady lawyer in a world where nobody wants ladies to be lawyers. And she's trying to like Mm. figure out if this poor little student girl is like, it's a murder or a a suicide or an accident. Like it's got all the tropes, uh, which I'm definitely enjoying. We are essentially investigating the death of a young girl called Frenny Cuttingmaster, who was maybe protesting the arrival of the uh, title's Bombay Prince, but we don't know for sure. We just know that Frenny showed up to uh, Miss uh, Paveen Mystery's office a week before mm-hmm. the Prince was supposed to, the, the Prince of Wales was supposed to arrive, and so Paveen was like, "I got to go check in on her and find out what she decided to do. Did she decide to protest or not?" And she died is the answer to that. We don't, you know, we don't know for sure what happened. One of the things I want to get into before we kind of summarize the plot here is I love the way that Sujata Massey writes Perveen's dialogue. Mm. There's like a sense of terseness about the way that she speaks. I mean, the way that she keeps interrupting people. Yeah. (laughs) It's great. It's great. She sticks her nose where it doesn't belong. She says what she thinks (laughs) and she is a loud mouthed, Indian woman in a culture that doesn't necessarily respect those kinds of people. Yeah, and it bites back a few times in this novel already. It does. It does. The father of the girl who dies calls her out on it and he's like complaining. He's like, why? Of like of all the detectives in the detective fiction world, <laughs> why did it have to be you who's looking to my daughter's death? This is insulting. It's really just a good time, but doesn't uh, shy away from being a bad time when it needs to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how far we can go into that, but this novel definitely made me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean, Perveen just about gets assaulted before she gets she's assaulted. whisked away by yeah. a taxi. Well, she doesn't even get saved. It would have been a perfect opportunity and hold your tongue, Flex. I'm sure you have things to say about this character, but it would have been a perfect time for her love interest Colin Sandringham to sweep her off her feet and say, I'll save you <laughs> from the thugs. Get out of this house, Herds. What? But what are you on about? Could, it could have been that, but it wasn't. It was just like a random, like awful, uncomfortable scene. You're right. This this novel about the agency of the first female yeah. lawyer What's in all I'm of saying? India really could have just been saved by Colin <laughs> showing up. Hold on now. I didn't say he could be saved. I said that it's 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 saved by not having Colin show up. In fact, he's a rather okay. useless character, which I which I enjoy. <laughs> um but yeah, no, this this novel does not 
shy away from tough themes. Uh, and I respect that. That's what I'm trying to say. It is a, and I, I think you, you probably enjoy the novel a lot because of this in that it's very character focused where we've barely looked at the crime scene at all. We've like seen no. that she had a smashed face, being told that she maybe fell over, but the entire novel is us just going from character to character and not in the like, uh, lake house murder style thing. No, we're not cutting where, from person to person. Biting the next character into the room. No, it, it reminds me a lot of the way that Solari does her scene transitions in the like Roland Sinclair series, where so much of it is the set piece and how we got the characters to be in that context that like dresses and sets the stage for the novel, and it's really yeah. compelling. I think my favorite part of this novel is uh, when we sort of interrupt a scene because. Perveen says something at a moment when maybe she shouldn't have said anything. And then all the characters in the scene will kind of stop and say, well, that's silly. Why would you think that? And she explains herself. Yeah. And there's like a page, you know, dedicated to her having a debate with the, with the, the characters in the room with her as to why a certain piece of British legislation or a certain Indian cultural practice should be changed. I actually really enjoy it. It's so know? fascinating too, because it falls like just shy of feeling like exposition yes. by having it become a discussion yes. between those but it, characters. You're, you're absolutely correct. It could so easily cross that line, but Sajada Massey rides it perfectly so that we get like a good load of information, but it still feels like something that should have happened in the scene. It's it's also character building. Like the, the discussion about the autopsy is with her father and her father, because the, the rule is, you know, if a, if a British surgeon determines something about a corpse, you are not allowed to dispute that. And so, of course, Perveen's argument is, well, if an Indian doctor was saying, so, like, we'd be able to contest their findings because shouldn't everything be open to in- inspection and interrogation because it's a legal case. And the reason why the British have put that law there, and I'm look, I'm learning, this is great, is because they want to override the Indian medicine practices with the British by giving them an inherent uh, authority over whatever or what an Indian doctor might say. There are there are so many fantastic examples of like this this active challenge, and I also think that the novel does a good job of justifying why actively challenging norms is like so important to its ethos the different types of action that the people in India are taking, how they're conflicting with each other. The fact that like the British don't really trust the Parsis. It's kind of a relation of necessity. Well, the British don't trust the Parsis, but everybody else doesn't trust the Parsis because they're trying to earn the trust of the British. Yes, exactly. So they've just screwed themselves. It's great. I mean, it's not great. It, it's unfortunate. It's, it's compelling. It's, it's, it's good drama, right? Yeah, yeah. There is one other thing that I wanted to, to put into our minds Uh-oh. just to wrap this segment up before we continue on with the rest of the novel herds. Mm-hmm. The 16 Indian historical novels that I've read over the course of this journey, mm-hmm. our history of India, even writing about it with this decolonializing intention, we get to see the Taj Hotel. We get to see the gate for Prince Edward. It's like, you know, Malabar Hill, as we've mentioned over and over again. And it's fascinating that, like, despite trying to challenge the ideas of what colonialism has meant to India and what India means outside of colonialism, Mm -hmm. we can't escape that the records show the same things. I was going to say- Because they're like the only records that are left. You'd think that there wasn't any Indian history before the British arrived because that's- that's all we're reading about, right? That's that's the yeah. part of it. Like we're looking at different periods, obviously, before and after the British Indian separation. The you know, but I'm sure there are mystery novels somewhere that are set before that time period, but we haven't found them. Yeah, if you listening have any suggestions of authors that you've had translated that cover a different history of India that you like to send our way, our contact details up on the Two SER website or on social media, and we'd love to hear about I was it and share say, it on the show. Th- though we have finished our stretch in India, I'm sure we could return for a, oh, a different period, perhaps. Gosh, you would not believe how many people have sent me messages being like, why didn't you cover this in Japan? Like, guys, we're going back. I mean, look, I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, we definitely will. I, I'm sure I've mentioned to you, but I, I have a friend who also listens to the show, and they said, wow, you've been in Japan a long time. Aren't you going to cover something else? I thought the whole point was that you like go around the world. We just can't please everyone, can we, Herds? We can't. It's impossible. I, I don't know if we can please God, anyone ridiculous. except ourselves. <laughs> what, what we're really saying <laughs> is lower your standards. Please do. Uh, <laughs> look, my standards are already at rock bottom. That's that's the whole point. Anyway, <laughs> the Bombay Prince 
is a great book. <laughs> we are discussing The Bombay Prince by Sajada Massey. We'll be back towards the end of the show to discuss the mystery and challenge her oh. to this here puzzle. Good luck, me. Good luck, you. I'm glad I'm glad your standards are so low for mystery solving flex. <laughs> I should be able to meet them at least. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. And we'll be back with more of that in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Coming up at the Sydney Writers Festival on the 20th of May, Suzanne Leal will be joined for the Mother of All Crimes panel by Jane Caro, author of The Mother, Laura Elizabeth Woollett, author of The Newcomer, and today's guest, Danuka McKenzie, author of The Torrent. Now, The Torrent is Danuka's award-winning debut novel set in the near Wild West that is northern New South Wales. If you're interested in that panel, we'll have links up on the podcast, but for now, let's get down to business. Danuka, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's lovely to be here. All right. It's great to have you on. (laughs) Now, Danuka, it wouldn't be crime fiction without a, a time bomb to keep our blood pressure high as we read. Uh, but you've replaced the usual metaphorical arrival of the storm with a literal storm and the impending arrival of our protagonist, Kate's child. How does the last week of pregnancy compare to the last minute revisions of a debut novel? (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I guess the uh, tension in a, you know, crime fiction novel, um, the idea of her being that pregnant and her being that vulnerable in that stage of her life and sort of being a policeman, I think, you know, it automatically lends tension. And I think, you know, having spoken to... (laughs) To readers now, I didn't actually realise how much tension that would actually create um, because I think it built up this this um, this real issue in in the reader's mind. Um, whereas I guess for me it was on the basis that you know when I was writing, uh, when I originally started writing this story, I was very pregnant, <laughs> and so there's the character. Um, and in terms of <laughs> How, how much is it like uh, revising a book? Well, it's only long, so <laughs> I guess it's, it's an arduous process. Yes, yes, it is definitely an arduous process, but uh, certainly the the final uh, you know release into the world is not as painful, shall we say that? No, physically painful anyway. I mean, I couldn't imagine, but it's good to hear it from 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 your mouth, uh, Danuka. I appreciate you telling us. <laughs> Now I, I wanted to to jump into some of the, uh, the 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 deeper the deeper sides of this novel. Um, now in, in crime fiction, uh, there's kind of a harmful stereotype around mental illness when it comes to to the criminal. Um, it's very easy to say, you know, the psycho did it because they're a psycho. We don't need any more justification. Um, several of the characters in your story are dealing with depression, trauma other mental illnesses. How did you go about kind of incorporating these people as characters that that matter to the story while sidestepping these narrative pitfalls? So for me, I mean, I think, you know, mental health and, and you know, the precursors to that, I, I guess what got them to that place is what I'm interested in. And I certainly don't want to demonise anyone for that because, I mean, I think, you know, what I would love for people to do is when they're reading this book is to hopefully feel in that situation themselves and then and kind of ask that question in their head, well, what would I have done in that situation? It's interesting you brought that angle of, you know, thinking how would I act in the situation uh, because I, I noticed in particular your portrayal of the, the autistic child Noah um, who is a, a key aspect of the mystery. And he was portrayed with a lot of, I thought, love and, and care. Um, I personally care a lot about the portrayal of people on the spectrum. Uh, and it really struck me how well you managed to keep him relevant to the mystery um, while highlighting both the positive and kind of negative aspects uh, of his mental illness. Do you, do you think there's any aspect of his character that you would, you would write differently or you think you could, you know, you would you would show off more cleanly if you had to, to write him again? Um, certainly. I mean, you know, when I was writing Noah, obviously I was very aware that, uh, you know, I was writing outside of my lived experience. So it was, you know, certainly that was, you know, absolutely front of mind in terms of ensuring that I, uh, you know, did Noah justice and did, you know, that depiction as far as I could sort of um, do that from from a person living outside of that experience. So I guess certainly, you know, I used the tools that are in my um, disposal, which are, you know, obviously research, reading and feedback. And really, I mean, Noah's storyline is very much, again, what interested me uh, is, again, the parenting side because, 
I don't know if you know this, but you know the, the parenting thread as 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 I guess a theme runs through the book. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's quite well, pervasive. Yes, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and and not only you know I guess you know parenting in you know in all its forms because obviously the Kate side is you know parenting a very small child, but also there's issues around adults and and their relationships with their parents and teenagers and their relationships with their parents. So that kind of goes through the theme. And with Noah's storyline, it was more along the lines of, I guess, how parental fears about their children and I guess that that fear of societal censure um, can be manipulated and taken advantage of. Now, your, your novel follows a, a half Sri Lankan pregnant woman on a police force surrounded by men. Um, how do you tackle writing empathetic characters uh, or, or characters we can be empathetic towards who also harbor extreme prejudice for one of many reasons? Um, <laughs> how do you tackle that? Um, again, you know, I think it's all about the information available to that individual and, and, you know, the culture that they've grown up in. So, again, you know, a person doesn't necessarily, is not necessarily bad because they ha- they hold a certain view that they've come to through their own upbringing. Um, it's, it's the fact that, I mean, I guess, you know, it's the, it's the issue of if they've had the opportunity to learn and then they choose not to, okay, that's a different thing. But I guess most people, most people, uh, you know, are trying to do the best that they can. Um, and so even the bad guys, <laughs> within inverted commas, in this, again, I really wanted to show, okay, you know, there are there may be reasons, there may be resentments, and often, and often the the issues that they end up uh, doing or the or their behavior is more a reflection of them rather than the person they're perpetrating that against. So it's it's a defense, you know, it's it's usually a hang up that they have. Um, so yeah, so again, you, you want to see threads of people, even the people you absolutely dislike and not the nicest people, you know, I guess the job of a writer is to still sit in their skin and see what's making them do that, you know? So well, it's funny you mention uh the the two sides of the story because there is a subtle undertone about the the power of media that permeates this novel. And we're shown through the dual stories of Gabby, the celebrity athletic wife of Joel, who's our supposed murder victim, um, and the story of Annette, who you just mentioned, his mother and alleged crazy old bat, um, that pretty people have a much better chance of getting their story out to the world and of being accepted. Um, What do we need to remember when news only shows us pretty suffering? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think, you know, certainly that is the idea of not taking everything that's shown to us as on face value, you know, and and trying to see what's underneath that, what's behind that, and why is this person getting the the airtime and and not that person? And you know, I mean, look, you know, not to go into it too much, but obviously this has played out very recently in the media with you know the the you know the very recent case of um, you know. The, the child abduction in, in Western Australia where, you know, th- there's been numerous cases of, um, you know, similar cases for, for Indigenous people, but whether that got the same, you know, um, news uh, uh, sort of um, coverage, uh, you know, because every life is important, you know, every, certainly not every child's life is so important. And, and you know, who is making that decision, you know, f- from the point of view of TV stations and from the point of view of news media, to, to give which story the airtime, you know, and it, and it's awful for the parents at the back end of that to, to not be the people who get that airtime, you know? Now, it's written, uh, Danuka, in the back of my e-reader here that the next Kate Miles novel, Taken, is coming out in 2023, I believe. What, what can we expect and how can we get excited for more of Kate's Wild Adventures? <laughs> Kate's Wild Adventures, yes. That's the name of the book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So essentially, uh, we pick up Kate's story, uh, you know, a few months after the ending at, uh, at the back of the torrent. So in this story, I guess uh, it's, uh, I don't know how much to give away because I'm not sure how much I'm meant to give away because we haven't really gone through the edits or anything. So I guess suffice to say it is the next in the series and certainly I um, some of those relationships uh, that I, you know, I guess I open up certainly with her and her dad are uh, explored more fully in the second one, I would say that. Yeah, I mean, according to, and obviously say as much as you can or are willing to, but according to the title and I think a little bit of what's in the 
the, the preview or whatever. It says, you know, what, what will Kate do when the most precious thing is taken from her? Yes. Hmm, I wonder, I wonder what could be taken, this this parent with two children. It's a dog, yeah. It's a pet. It's a chicken, yeah. Yeah, no confirm or deny. Yeah, the chicken, exactly. The chicken will be taken away and she'll have to hunt it down with grave. That's why grave features in the next novel so much, because right. they're chasing the chicken around. Makes sense to me. Oh, well. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you're listening to Death of the Reader. This has been Herds chatting with Danuka McKenzie, author of The Torrent. I'm looking forward to the next Kate Miles novel coming in 2023. Thank you very much for joining me on the show today, Danuka. Thank you so much for having me. I so appreciate it. Wow, so cool. It's been an absolute blast. And now for more on The Bombay Prince by Sujata Masi. You're on to a CR 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader, Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are here discussing chapters 1 to 12 of The Bombay Prince by Sujata Massey. <laughs> Herds? Flex, what have you done to me, Flex? You've given me so few clues to work with. What possessed you? I just I just wanted to end on a character-driven novel that I felt you could enjoy, Herds. Look, I am enjoying it. I'm enjoying the first half of reading this, the actual reading of the novel. But the solving of the mystery... I don't even know. Where do I even begin? I mean, I have some. Where do you even I, begin? I have some guesses. Listen, Herds, <laughs> I was thinking back uh, to a discussion that we had when we were covering Murder in Old Bombay by Nev March at the end of last year uh-huh. and how our success in managing to bamboozle one another these days compared to when we started seems to be more founded upon how easy of a time we had solving the novel. If it was easy for us- it's going to be hard for the other. And if it's hard for us, it's going to be easy for oh, the other. Oh, no. And how did you go? How did you go with this novel, Flex? Cut to the chase. I had an absolute breeze oh, no. with this novel. So you herds. Oh, no. I'm never going to be able to solve it. in trouble. This is not good. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've played a double whammy here because I've given you a character-driven novel, which you'd it's think- true. Would play right to your strengths. All right. Well, it's a but good thing. I don't thing. think you're going to see the see the things I saw. Herds. We'll, we'll see. It's a good thing that I have two two sessions to to work this one out, and potentially four points on the table. Because look, the chances of me not getting any of those points is is basically zero. I look. Well, <laughs> I mean, we we do have a stipulation that says if you present two different theories, you get a point. So you you correct on that front. Anyway, shall we get on with the discussing Please. of who killed Frenny? I would love to know. Let me tell you, Flex. I had a wonderful time reading through this novel and not getting any hard clues. Uh huh. Except that apparently dresses are very important. There's a mysterious journalist who may not be all that they seem. And Frenny has a very- Is this Naval? Um, I don't know. Is that is that photographer guy? I'm talking yeah. about the the American oh. who's wandering around with Paveen's brother, who apparently has, like, his, his hair color is very important, and he's called uh, an, an Indian slang term, despite the fact that he's obviously American. Look- there's some weird stuff going on in here, and I want to I wanna put forward the theory that it was, in fact, Mr. Terence Grady who has done the deed, who has killed Franny oh. in possibly hot blood. Hold on. Because- What was this yes. tangent about a journalist then? Because they're the same character, Flex. What? Because- What? Mr. Grady and this journalist guy whose name escapes me, J- I want to call him JJ, so I'm going to call him JJ. It's JP. JP- <laughs> JJ- as I was saying. JJ is the hospital. <laughs> JP. Fine. I guess I can't call him JJ if there already exists a JJ in the story. It's <laughs> it's one of those things. It's a sacred a sacred bond. I think that the boys in the student union and Mr. Grady, they wanted to like do something more drastic. I don't know if it was literally to assassinate the Bombay Prince. Maybe it was, but it went something went wrong. Now hold on. Herds, I know that you and I recently you know watched yes. the 1990s adaptation of Tom Clancy's Patriot Games. Did we? Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. That did happen. <laughs> which which features an, an IRA I don't uh, remember very well. rebel group yes. going to extreme measures. <laughs> Are you crossing wires here, Herds? No. Is that what's happening? Are no. you saying that Mr. Grady is perhaps going too far? He's not really a fan of the British. He's of an Irish uh, of an Irish Look, background himself. He's apparently Irish, but maybe maybe could pass as American with a little bit of a, an accent tweak. Mm. Because Frenny's whole thing is that she's like obsessed with the truth and telling the truth. 
I think that she found out about this this plot like as it was happening, and Grey decided to throw her off the off the the school rather than have her <laughs> now that tell you what's going on. Can we talk about that scene at the beginning of the novel <laughs> what? where Perv- Pervin and Frenny, Pervin and Frenny are chatting? You're talking about the communist children. Is that where we're going? No, 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 no. no. Okay. And uh, Pervin's like, "Well, you could just you could just chuck a sicky." And yes. Frenny is like, "Well, that. I can't lie." Yeah. And Pervin's like, "Oh yeah, Parsis aren't supposed to lie. That's why we're trusted." as lawyers have you considered lying yeah 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 she's <laughs> she's a hypocrite Pavine's great it's so um, good like the best part is she tries it too she says I- i'm feeling unwell in the morning and then her parents make her go anyway and then she gets murdered by terence grady anyway the final nail i mean i'm sure there are many other nails we'll get to but yeah. the other thing that i want to mention is that for some reason when we get to terence grady the, the like the only thing that we learn about there are two things that are highlighted one is that he's yeah Tai is made of local silk, which means that he's like uh-huh. supporting local businesses, which is very yep, good yep, of him. Yep. He's anti-British, which mm-hmm. we already kind of knew, but also that his portmanteau is is beaten up, perhaps because he'd been in some kind of a struggle. Uh. <gasps> Maybe either the portmanteau has Frenny's satchel inside, or it is Frenny's satchel. Done. Nailed him. What if the evidence is being planted on him, Herds? I mean, like, How I'm not going to say you're incorrect it? here. Nah, that's but dumb. What evidence? Surely, surely someone close to Franny, like a trusted, you know, overseer of the Your student friend? union. Overseer? Oh, right. Grady. Wait, what about him? You don't you don't think that he could have- Surely he's, ma- he's maybe easy to free. She's got a crush on him. No, she's got a crush on him. She doesn't understand he's a bad man until it's too late. Is gender, gender politics, it's there. It's all there. All the evidence is there that I need to convict this man. I, I can't poke holes in this. It's impossible. Good. There I are mean, no right. flaws in this it's theory. Perfect. And I don't need any hints. I, I mean, especially considering that, you know, we didn't see Grady until after the death happened. It's true. It's, he disappeared for a period of time. He, don't, he Who didn't knows? even disappear. He wasn't there to begin with. He showed up after the death happened well, practically go. exclusively. See, I, I assumed he was in there with the- So you're just supporting my theory, which oh, means that I yeah. must be correct. I'm sure I have no ulterior motive in doing you so. You couldn't have. You couldn't have any ulterior motive for telling me a piece of information that I'd overlooked. That's ridiculous. I guess the question that I have here, Herds- Grady's going to have his career ruined yeah, sure. by sending Dinesh. That sounds right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You think, you think that a white man in India is going to have his career ruined for giving an instruction? For telling Dinesh to go to, and maybe- to, to an Indian man? To an Indian boy to maybe go kill the Bombay prince? Yes. If you were, if you, hold on, Flex, imagine for a second that you are a, t- a teacher and you tell your student to go and kill- Prime Minister of Australia, let's just say. I'm picturing it. And somebody finds out that you've you've done that. You don't think you'd get in a lot of trouble for that? You think you'd be like, oh, it's just a joke, mate. You told your student to go and kill the Prime Minister of Australia. I, I don't know, Herds. I feel like the testimony of Grady over Dinesh would hold more weight in court. You know, that that's the- that's Well, that's why he hasn't killed him yet. Ah, <laughs> I see. So this Obviously. Is, this is, this is, we're setting yeah. up the long con here. Refine this theory- and you'll be you'll be there. You'll be done. Sure. You can practically relax for the next week and just enjoy the novel. No, 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 no. I need to wipe my butt off. I got a whole other theory. No mystery to, make. to solve here. Are you you sure? basically got it. No, 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 no. I gotta make up a fake theory for next week. You, you keep I forgetting. Mean, obviously. You keep forgetting. I need to make my terrible theory that doesn't make any sense for next week. But I mean that comes to you easily, Hertz. That's it just does. the theory that you that first came to your mind when you were reading the book. So you 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 think that it, it comes easy, but actually I like to put some effort into my time here. Ah. So that's the difference between me and you, Flex. I like to put effort into things. So. It's, it's true. There we go. <laughs> I'm notorious. Notorious for only just taking <laughs> one guess it. at yeah. these things. That's true. That's what you do. <laughs> Point is, all sixteen of these novels. Point is, I skim read them. Yeah, I, I mean, I figured. How else would you read that many? I couldn't read that many without, you know, skim reading them or using an audio book or something. So you know. Oh, let's let's not talk trash about audio book readers, herds. They're respectable. <laughs> I people. am one of them. Thank you. I am respectable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that's my theory. Terence Grady hid her satchel in his in his own portmanteau. That's the word. Mm-hmm. He's doing it to protect the fact that he ordered the hit on the prince. That makes sense to me, Herds. I think we can tie that up here. <laughs> what chapters are we doing, Flakes? Let me know. We're going to be covering chapters 13 to 26 
next week on the show herds. It's a lot of chapters. My goodness. It is a lot of chapters, but it's also only two more chapters than uh, it would have been if I'd split the book up by chapter number alone. Fair enough. So you've got to consider what was the reason for this. I'm sure there are some crucial clues in those final two chapters. Or maybe we find out that Freddy was never even dead the entire time. Maybe so. Maybe she so. had her head crushed in. Maybe it wasn't even her. This is Death of the Reader. We are discussing Sajada Massey's The Bombay Prince, the latest novel in the Pervine Mystery series. We'll be back next week with chapters 13 to 26 on your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we'll see you then.